Welcome back to Healthcare Consumerism Radio. This is uh, Brent Macy, Managing Director for the Institute for Healthcare Consumerism and joined with CEO and founder of the Institute for Healthcare Consumerism, Doug Field. And joining us uh, on this segment is uh, Russell Benaroya. Russell is the co-founder and CEO of Every Move. Welcome to the program, Russell. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Great. Thanks for joining us. And uh, kind of give our audience kind of a, a brief overview on Every Move. Yeah, sure. So we started Every Move about two years ago to create what we thought the market really needs, and that's the the good driver discount for health for consumers. Mm-hmm. We want to help consumers that are increasingly capturing their their health through wearables, fitness app tra- trackers, and, and devices uh, to be able to turn that healthy activity into real world value. So we've created a marketplace where health plans and employers and brands can reward and recognize consumers for doing things in their life they want to support. Now, one of the, you know, kind of the topic, you know, kind of here for this segment that you had kind of written out is wellness fail, top five reasons why employer incentive programs are not working. Kind of, kind of hit, uh, kind of give the audience a feel for, for why you believe that is. There are a number of reasons why wellness programs within employer groups aren't aren't working. I mean, I think the first one is we have to distinguish between um, the the work that employers want to do to address high risk, their high risk population, Mm -hmm. and the work that they want to do to provide recognition, rewards, encouragement, and incentives for the 95% of the population that's trying to stay well. I generally think those two get bundled, and inadvertently, employees – um, end up feeling more like patients than they do like consumers, and they feel more like they're being prescribed to by their employer to do certain things that really don't align with the types of healthy activities those consumers would want to do outside of the workplace. So there's just a mismatch, and it's not creating the kind of motivation that's truly going to help the employee stay well. So what are the, you know, from a motivation standpoint, what are, what are some of the keys to get that employee population motivated? Yeah, I think there are really three primary criteria to what drives motivation, and uh, a well-known author by the name of Daniel Pink has coined this well, and he captures three, three uh, areas. First is mastery, the second is autonomy, and the third is purpose. So mastery, autonomy, and purpose working together drive motivation. And I would largely argue that wellness programs implemented by and managed by employers haven't really triggered those three areas of motivation. Mm-hmm. Mastery is not get, is enabling an employee to do what they want to do and feel confident that they're uh, getting command of their actions. Autonomy is being able to do what you want to do. I may not just be a walker. I may run or swim. Maybe I garden or do housework. Mm-hmm. And purpose is about feeling like I am doing something that is for more than just a $100 gift card that I might get from an employer because I'm filling out this survey. So you, so when you look at, you know, in the second one kind of, you know, hit home with me is, is – Instead of telling you that you need to go walk go walk a mile every day, you actually choose the exercise that you or the the activity that you'd like to do, right? Exactly. Embed into the fabric of how that individual already lives their life. Mm-hmm. And if you can meet them where they're at and support them on their terms, I think employers have a much greater likelihood of truly being that partner rather than being seen as that top-down prescriber, which typically doesn't yield the kind of participation percentages that employers are looking for. Now, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of age Doug here, and he's not going to like this, but Doug, you know, Doug was around when, you know, health and wellness, you know, 30 years ago, was it was a big, it was part of the, an employer's culture. I mean, they had the plant health and wellness programs, and, you know, now they're coming in back into vogue uh, again today. If you look at some of the health and wellness programs, they still struggle with some of the same, you know, engagement problems, you know, that they did 30 years ago. Where do you see engagement and and why is participation in studies kind of low when it comes to health and wellness? I think a walled garden has been built between an 
an individual's life, health life within an employer and their health life outside of the employer. And unfortunately, programs have not enabled the frictionless movement of that activity between those two, uh, those two ar- arenas. One of the problems is uh, with the, the acceleration around mobile technology and fitness tracking wearables, consumers who are also employees are moving about in their life doing the things they want to do, being getting healthy, getting fit with people that may not be their colleagues in their workplace. But then in the workplace, there's this program that is being pushed down to them that has, is not of interest outside of their work life. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, they want to do the minimum necessary so that they can spend more time doing what it is they actually want to do. So they check the box on the minimum to get that reward card, which typically means doing a lot of manual entry at the end of the quarter to get that $100. So then they can move on to do what they actually do as a consumer and using the technology that works for them. Now, as part of the healthcare law, and correct me if I'm wrong here, as part of the healthcare law, isn't you know there's there's an increased incentive within the law for employers to provide incentive and wellness programs, correct? There absolutely there absolutely is, which is one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, wellness and engagement coming more into vogue. Mm-hmm. Now, the the trick is, can we provide engagement programs and not just "Quote unquote wellness in the form of filling out a health risk assessment or getting your biometric." Test. Now these now these health and wellness programs they're they're not cheap by any means for an employer. I mean there, it is a significant cost to to put these in play. You know why you know why do you see you know employers who maybe not have they maybe don't have the right amount of engagement? Why do you see them continuing to stick with um, with these programs? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great question. It's because sadly interests are massively mis, misaligned. I think the issue is, in many cases, HR managers are checking the box that they have uh, adopted a wellness program, and they may be compensated on: Did you implement a wellness program this year? Yes, I did. In wellness companies still price their service to get paid regardless of whether or not employees actually (laughs) participate. And so they don't really have a tremendous motivation to drive engagement. I think the the disruption that needs to occur is for programs that are not priced on a per-employee-per-month basis are quite honestly, almost given away, like the price should be very, very low, and the, and the incentive to the HR manager should not be based on whether or not they implemented a program, but whether or not they hit certain participation objectives. Yeah, Russell, I, 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 this is Doug, and uh, nice to have you on the program, by the way. Um, I think we're seeing that change, and I think, I think you're going to see it accelerate and change pretty rapidly. I mean, you know, the one dynamic that Bryn alluded to and you guys both talked about is, is – Traditionally, when something doesn't work for an employer, they disengage and move away from it. They're not moving away from health management. And I think the smart employers are trying to figure out how to do it right, how to measure it the right way, how to implement it the right way, how to have it inspire their employee population, which I think what you're you're focused on, not just incentivizing, because that's a short-term fix a lot of times. Um, so I I think you're well-timed because I, I – I do think you're seeing that disruption take place with a relook at health management and how does this improve productivity in our organizations? How does it help us lower our costs? How does it really create better, you know, and, and healthier uh, families, consumers, employees, et cetera? I, com- I completely agree. We are trying to encourage employers to create a, a healthy uh, ecosystem, a healthy mm-hmm. culture within their organization, but it is, it is technology, it is mm-hmm. uh, access for consumers that they now are bringing into their workplace. Mm-hmm. Example, many people use RunKeeper or MyFitnessPal mm-hmm. in their consumer life. Why is it the employer saying, great, keep using that service, mm-hmm. we're going to come to support you in doing what 
you already want to do, mm-hmm. and we're going to give you a little boost of motivation, mm-hmm. a little more encouragement, maybe a opportunity to participate in a challenge, but still use the the app that works for you in your life. And we're and Doug, you're right. We're seeing that happening, and I think we just need to keep pushing it and pushing it because nothing ever uh, was widely adopted until the consumer truly took control, That's right. and we're seeing it happen. Russell, we've got about a, a little over a minute left on this program. Um, want to kind of give you an opportunity to leave the audience with a couple good takeaways and then let, let them know how they can contact you if, if they'd be interested in your solutions. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a couple of, of key, key takeaways for ways to offer incentives that can actually work. So one is make sure that any incentives that you provide around wellness are tied as closely to the act as possible. So tie it as closely to engagement as possible, not just to the administrative, say, filling out of a form or, or taking a test. Also, rewards shouldn't be too predictable or incentives shouldn't be too predictable. Make them surprising and delightful. Third, hard dollars create a lot of economic math for an employee. They're thinking, is it worth it for me to do this thing to get $100? Try to abstract away from hard dollar rewards into something that's more welcomed by the employee. And don't make rewards too too prescriptive, too prescriptive driven. Don't tell people you need to do this to get that because that's not going to sustain engagement over time. I'm happy if people want to get a hold of, of me and the work that we're doing at Every Move. So the best way to get a hold of me uh, directly is to send me an email at russell, two S's, two L's, at everymove.com. Hey, Russell, we really appreciate having you on the program today, and, and thank you for joining us. Have a great Easter weekend. And uh, to the rest of our audience, we will see you next next week on uh, Healthcare Consumerism Radio. This is AmericasWebRadio.com, the best in chat radio designed just for you.